Hello everyone. I hope all of you are doing great today and I really hope so that you worked harder and worked on your audit risk after the day one and you worked on your internal control systems which are designed and implemented by the management. So you basically worked on your major topic number two, which is called internal control systems. So if anybody out there who missed the day one and the day two, first of all, you don't have to worry about it. Primarily because of the two reasons. Number one. The day three has got nothing to do with day one or day two. Secondly, and more importantly, if for any reason, if you have missed the day one or the day two, you can catch it up and the link of the day one webinar is now available in your WhatsApp group and the link for the day two webinar will be available within an hour or so. So don't worry. In fact, it is available on YouTube channel now. So dear students, there are three major topics in the double A syllabus and there are four minor topics within the double A syllabus. The first day was about the major topic number one audit risk. The second day was about the major topic number two internal control systems and the third day is about the major topic number three last but surely not the least which is called substantive procedures. So if anyone out there who is wondering what about the WhatsApp group if you want to join the WhatsApp group option number one you will get the link of the WhatsApp group within your question section or within the chat section. Secondly, if you are unable to join it with the help of that link, you can still contact me on my WhatsApp number and I will share the link with you. Uh, well, after an hour or so of the webinar, most probably by the end of the you know today's webinars somewhere around tonight. So this is the procedure. This is the mechanism which we uh, are going to deal with. So this is the third and the second last day of this ACCA's practice to pass webinar. And in order to make sure. In order to make sure that we. Will have a successful day on Monday 5th September 2022, which is the exam day for the double A students. We have to understand that the exam format for the double A is is the most challenging one when it comes to skill level papers. So among all skill level exams, this is the only exam where we have got three sections rather than two. If you are going to compare it with PM, FR, tax, FM, all of them have got, you know, section A, two marks questions, 15 questions into 30 marks, section B, OTQs, three OTQs, but not the case in double A. In the double A, we have got only two sections. The section A, which is the most important section, which is the one of the most decisive thing when it comes to the double A students result. But unfortunately, all over the world, students are not paying good enough respect to the section A. You should solve three OTQs in the morning, three OTQs in the evening using different kits. Let's say Kaplan in the morning, PPP kit in the evening and you should solve 100% of your OTQs uh, ideally within this month. You need to finish them off within this month so that you could repeat those OTQs uh, within the next three, four days of the September. So we all are familiar that there are seven areas in total, three major. We have already covered two major areas, so we are left with one major only, uh, one major area only, which is the agenda for Monday that is today. Okay. Now when it comes to section A any area of the syllabus could be tested and will be tested from major topics to the minor topics when it comes to section B things are pretty much straightforward. You will have three long questions in section B all those three long questions will dominate or will focus on the risk controls and procedures. And keep one thing in mind if you are going to get 30 mark long question on risk you are going to get the next 20 mark question on controls. If you are going to get 30 mark question on controls, you are going to get the next 20 mark question on risk. And the last question would be definitely focusing on the substantive procedures along with the flavor of completion review and most importantly audit reporting, which I'm going to teach tomorrow. The pass rates of double A are very pathetic, but you still have got 
15 or days two weeks so you can counter that you can be among those students who are going to ace the exam on monday 5th september 2022 you should not be you know going on monday 5th september to attempt the exam rather you need to secure the exam so 39 39 38 oh well okay 44 but again 39 that looks very very unpleasant to the eyes and we have to understand why the pass rates are so pathetic the pass rates are so 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 pathetic because majority students are solving questions well either on paper or on microsoft word blank sheet but nobody or greater majority is not paying good enough respect to the acca practice platform so please from tonight onwards do not attempt anything other than acca practice platform many students are ignoring the section a they wrongly believe that if they are good in the long questions that is section b they are automatically good in section a it is not the case even if somebody has scored 65 or 70 marks in the double a let it be the last attempt or the second last attempt they are going to share and they are going to let you know that the otqs were challenging otqs are challenging why because you guys are not paying good enough respect to the otqs if you are going to solve otqs from both kids toys with the help of solution you need to read the solution automatically things will become easier for you in section a well you need to invest half an hour daily don't worry about it you need to invest half an hour daily on the bookish knowledge based questions you will get some kind of you know bookish straightforward knowledge based notes in, within your whatsapp group as far as the number fourth point is concerned i don't think so if somebody has attended the yesterday's and the day before yesterday's webinar i don't think so he or she is having problem in risk and controls anymore yeah you need to invest time and you need to practice the stuff that's a separate story otherwise conceptually you guys are absolutely clear and ready for the risk and ready for the controls last but surely not the least so ideally speaking you need to attempt three mock exams i'll be conducting the mock exam for my students who are my regular batch students i'll be conducting their mock exam on 24th august because i finished the syllabus around 14 15 august so i gave them a reasonable time of 10 days so maybe after the webinar if you are not an enrolled student if you are not a regular student maybe you can go for the mock exam maybe on 27th or 29th of august you can't delay it more because you need to get the feedback from your tutor and you need to make sure you are attempting at least three mock exams under strict exam exam conditions using acca practice platform and you need to get at least feedback on your one of your mock exam that's the bare minimum so this this slide right now in front of you apart from the fact that why students fail in double a not in triple a this slide is the real game changer i'm telling you this is the critical success factor this is something you need to look up to these six points if you're going to you know religiously follow these six things you will ace the exam you need you need to make sure you are not compromising on anything which is right now in front of your hopefully laptop not your phone so this is it i i really hope so that you are going to work on these six points so my plan was very straightforward and very very much clear we covered 20 percent of the syllabus approximately on day one audit risk we covered another 20 percent on day two uh will well in form of internal controls why i have given so much weightage to the day three substantive procedure 30 percent because when it comes to substantive procedures you will face question number three of the section b on substantive procedure moreover the question on audit risk whether it is the question number one of the section b or whether it is a question number two of the section b 99% in 99% cases there will be at least one or sometime two exam requirements with respect to substantive procedures within the risk question so the substantive procedures are all over the place you will face substantive procedures in section a you will face substantive procedures within your audit risk question and you will have a complete full question on substantive procedures within the section b that is the question number three so relatively speaking the substantive procedures are spread out 
all over the exam so you will have you know a higher percentage of substantive procedures that's why i've given a weightage of approximately 30 percent now before i move on to the today's topic which is called substantive procedure one more thing or one last thing what about day four can you ignore day four well one of the most common characteristic of the failure students is a they score very pathetic marks in the section a b they are never prepared for their minor topics you will have ethics within your section b you will have corporate governance within your section b you will have internal audit and you will definitely have audit report within your section b so you cannot ignore section b and what about section a the section a will have more flavors of of minor topics less flavors of major topics so overall the weightage of the minor topics will go beyond 30 percent and when you incorporate section a i believe the weightage will go approximately 40 percent out of the 100 percent so how important the day four would be how important the day four would be so day four would be a very critical day because the day four yes sn you're absolutely right the day four would cover the you know those bits and pieces which makes the student fumble a student might score 48 and if you're going 47 48 46 and if you are going to ask him or her how much did you attempt he or she would say oh, well 84 86 oh, well not more than 90 85 to 90 well why you didn't attempt the rest of the 10 to 15 mark paper well i was not prepared for that so i tried to ex extract 50 out of 85 and how much did you get 47 46 so that's a very poor and a pathetic approach you need to attempt 100 mark paper you need to work on the minor topics yes fatma you are absolutely right equally important i think that's a very good phrase equally important or sometimes more important than any one particular major topic so you need to make sure that you do attend the day four and the day four will cover everything it will almost cover the entire syllabus so this is it this is about the day four and now what now we need to move to the today's topic and the today's topic is substantive procedures okay give me a second please okay so let's start the show and the agenda is 
substantive procedures and for sure it is the backbone of the double a if somebody is damn good in substantive procedures and if somebody is damn good in section a otqs mark my words i can give you an assurance obviously a reasonable one you are going to pass the paper with flying colors let me repeat that because it's very important if somebody can assure me if somebody is going to make me a, make a call well don't call send a voice note and if somebody is going to let me know sir i am damn good in two things of the double a number one the otqs number two the substantive procedures in return i can assure you or i can give you a guarantee that you are going to pass the paper with minimum 60 marks well if you are really damn good in risk controls and ethics and corporate governance you might go beyond 70 but bare minimum you will end up scoring 60 marks if you are good at these two things number one substantive procedures number two otqs why i'm saying that if you are good at otqs if you have covered the otqs from both kids choice you will score 24 out of 30 in section a and if you are good at substantive procedure you are going to score another 24 from 30 are you 48 out of 60 48 out of 60 now even if you are not that good or if your preparation is average or even maybe below average for risk for controls and for other topics well you will score at least at least 10 marks out of 40 remaining marks so how much are you going to get to add 10 more your number is 58 out of 100 so how how this story sounds to you are you going to buy this narrative or not if we are going to score extraordinary marks in substantive procedures and in otqs we are at least getting 58 or let's call it a round off number 60 score out of 100 so dear students you need to work on these two topics for the next 4 to 5 days and you will you will rock big time that's it with this beautiful note well are you getting this point can you can you can you listen to the violin which is playing in the background which tells you that this is the perfect love story which i'm telling you if you are damn good with respect to the substantive procedures and the otqs you are you are you are you are already there it's a walk in the park for you now well the walk in the park could be a difficult thing no okay so that's it so the topic is called substantive procedure and let me start with the marking scheme you will get one mark per procedure provided your procedure is a well explained one so you need to ex you need to come up with a well explained procedure what about exam requirement the exam requirement would be same for everyone describe substantive procedures the auditor should perform so this is definitely the most important area of the double a okay now dear students i need to teach you three things now listen to me carefully i need to teach you three things number one i need to teach you what are substantive procedures number second i need to teach you what are assertions number 3 i need to teach you what kind of evidence we are looking at so if somebody is good at these three things you are damn good when with respect to this topic called substantive procedures so as a student we need to apply the procedures a e i o u in order to get evidence called da da 3 so that so that so that we could verify the assertions called evcr or coca and if we are going to amalgamate these three things 
we will be getting a complete one mark so i need to teach you three things and let's start from the scratch so i need to teach you the first thing called substantive procedures now dear students all over the world the auditor has got two types of procedures or two types of actions the first type of procedure or action is the one where the auditor will try to verify will try to test will try to confirm whether the control system designed and implemented by the management is operating effectively or not and that action or that procedure is called test of controls the second type of procedure which the auditor can and will apply in fact must be applied by the auditor is called substantive procedure and when it comes to substantive procedure the auditor will try to verify whether the financial statements including the disclosures are reflecting a true and fair view or not so in other words when it comes to substantive procedures the auditor will try to verify whether the financial statements are making compliance with the ias ifrs with the financial reporting framework so substantive procedure is an action executed by the auditor in order to verify whether the numbers are reflecting a true picture or not whether the financial statements are reflecting a true and fair view with respect to the financial reporting framework or not is this clear what are substantive procedures okay now what do we have in substantive procedure well we have got a mnemonic called a e i o u let's explore them one by one a stands for analytical procedures analytical procedures means comparison comparison of the financial data with the non financial data comparison of this the financial data maybe this year's financial statement with the budgeted financial statement this year's financial statement with the industry average this year financial statement with the competitor this year's financial statement with the forecasted number so this is what we call analytical procedures why we are interested in analytical procedures because the analytical procedures would reveal if there is any if there is any unusual fluctuation within the data maybe there is some kind of unusual relationship which might reveal that the numbers are not exactly what we are expecting them to be so analytical procedure is one of the most important substantive procedure we have okay what about the second substantive procedure within that a e i o u the second one is called e for inquiries now what do i mean by inquiries as an auditor it's my fundamental right to inquire but i mean well i am going to inquire but who who's going to answer me well the auditor would inquire from the management so when it comes to inquiries it's all about the management we are going to inquire from the management and we are going to seek explanations we are going to raise concerns questions and we are going to seek answers from them so this is what we call inquire okay and i expect them to answer me obviously inquiries and confirmation now what about confirmation well when it comes to confirmation the majority of the confirmations which the auditor would like to you know obtain are from the third parties such as the debtors of my client the receivables of my client the payables of my client the lease provider of my client the insurance provider of my client the tax authorities the bank so all those third parties are mostly a valuable source of evidence and will get confirmations from them 
and that and those confirmations if we will be able to obtain them are going to be a very important and a very reliable source of evidence for the auditor okay analytical procedures one kind of an action inquiries another kind of an action a confirmation another kind of an action but there is a special kind of confirmation where i will inquire something from the management but i would like to get that confirmation in writing from the management so if i will ask the management to confirm a certain thing in writing we call it written representation and written representation is a unique or a special kind of confirmation which is obtained by the auditor from the management so we call it written representation written representation are a weak source of evidence because management can deviate from the you know verdict which they gave you in writing so normally the auditors would try to get the written representation at the very end of the overall audit almost near to the audit report auditor would not get written representation for each and every case auditor would get the written representation only if there is no or there are no other reliable audit evidence available so this is something you know there are th these are the two cents regarding the written representation so we are done with a analytical procedures b inquiries c confirmation okay inspection so the word inspection is frequently used by the auditor and when it comes to inspection the auditor would like to inspect two different things a the documents so I'll, i would like to inspect the good dispatch note i would like to inspect the good receive note i would like to inspect or review the loan agreement so the word inspection has got to do with documents number second i would like to inspect the tangible asset so i can't inspect the receivable but yes i can inspect the property i can inspect the plant i can inspect the inventory i would like to inspect the inventory in order to verify the physical condition of the inventory so inspection second last is what we call observation and observation are normally used when it comes to test of controls but we can use observation such as we can observe what management is doing or what kind of activities they are performing last but surely not the least whenever a calculation has been performed by the management obviously they are the ones who are going to prepare the financial statements i could recalculate their calculation i could get the breakdown from the management i could cast them in order to make sure there is no arithmetical mistake so recalculation is one of the most common substantive procedure so if you are going to audit receivable obviously you are going to get the breakdown of the receivable you are going to cast it in order to make sure there is no arithmetical mistake and you are going to you know agree it with the trial balance and the statement of financial position if you are auditing non current assets within the statement of financial position the overall amount will be a one single amount so you are going to get the breakdown of the non current assets you are going to cast them you are going to add them up and you are going to make sure that it there is no arithmetical mistake it is complete it is accurate and it agrees with again with the trial balance and the statement of financial position if you are auditing the non current liabilities or the bank in cash balance you are going to get the breakdown you are going to get the schedule of it the opening balance the additions the disposals or maybe cer certain loans have been added certain loans have been repaid during the year and at the end of the day you need to make sure that the year end figure agrees again with the trial balance and the statement of financial position so when it comes to recalculation i think this is one of the most commonly used substantive procedure which is available to the auditor and to the students obviously so are you all clear with respect to the first thing which i need to teach you which is called a e i o u are you all clear if you are clear can i have confirmation on that and then i'll move on okay yes written representation is a special kind of confirmation not normally used by the auditor but an auditor would use it if the situation 
requires it. Is this clear? Okay. Okay, so when it comes to confirmation, the third party confirmations are far more reliable as compared to the written representation. Why I'm saying that? Because written representation would be derived from the management. So management could lie, but those third parties are normally very reliable and then they are not going to lie because you're not auditing them. Okay, evidence collected from a third party is more reliable or the evidence provided by the audit team is more reliable. Definitely evidence collected through the third party is more reliable. Auditor generated evidences are the most reliable ones. Okay, Tareem, that's great. Okay. Yes, if you are reviewing a certain calculation or any document or maybe minutes of the meeting, this is one of the substantive procedure. So you tend to look or you tend to inspect the minutes of the meeting because it's it's kind of a document. But what do you do? What do you do with it? Because the minutes of the meetings are so long and lengthy, you got to review it. You got to digest it. So review is definitely one of the substantive procedure. Okay. Yes, Rihanna Edwards, you are absolutely right. Third party evidence is is more reliable as compared to the written representation. But auditor generated, if an evidence has been collected by the auditor himself or herself, that's the most reliable one. You will get such questions within your section A. Okay, Jamil has asked, do we need to rote learn these? No, you don't have to learn them. You have to practice the questions and automatically things will be, you know, absorbed. What are some information the audit and need written representation letter? Okay, last question as of now. So Naila has raised a question that she needs few examples on written representation. What what are the occasions or what situation would lead the auditor to get the written representation? I think you will get the written representation in a situation where other audit evidences are not available. For example, the management has, you know, classified a particular asset as an asset held for sale and you are unable to get other reliable evidence on that. So you will get written representation from the management regarding that. Maybe the management has recognized a certain amount of provision for a particular or for a particular thing. So you need to get the written representation from the management because maybe other evidence are not readily available to you. Okay, then. No, we are going to rely more on ourselves rather than the third parties. Yes, the third party evidence is more reliable as compared to the client specific evidence but I, I need to trust myself okay that's great well umar the third party evidence is more reliable when it is compared with the client generated evidence but if the third party evidence has been obtained by the auditor directly not not with the help of the management definitely it becomes more reliable okay bubika observation means that you are going to observe a particular process or an activity so when it comes to financial statement testing known as substantive procedure you are not going to heavily rely on observations but when it comes to test of controls which is about the process, uh, which is about the activity, you are going to use observations a lot there. Okay, can we move on now? So we need to understand three things. Number one, the substantive procedures, which is which is called AEIOU. Number second, we need to understand what things we need to verify, which is called assertions. Number third, we need to understand how are we going to get the evidence. 
inspection has got to do with two things you are going to inspect a tangible asset or a document so is this clear ibrahim well if a client is confident about a certain thing and they are not you know willing to deviate from their narrative i might want to get the written representation from them is this clear milan okay so we are done with the first thing which is called a e i o u let's move on let's move on to the second thing which is okay fine we need to apply a e i o u but why we are interested in applying a e i o u we want to apply a e i o u because the financial statements were prepared by the management and what do you think if the financial statements have been prepared by the management are they going to claim something about the financial statements well they are going to claim that the financial statements are reflecting a true and fair view but i need to verify those assertions right now the assertions could be divided into two families or two categories the first family or the first category of assertions is about the statement of financial position and when it comes to statement of financial position the assertions are e v c r what do you mean what do i mean by assertions assertions means certain things which are claimed by the management so they claim that yes we have prepared the financial statements for example the statement of financial position and all the assets or all the liabilities which we have recognized within the statement of financial position they do exist so there is nothing fake in it there is nothing fake in it everything which we have recognized as an asset or a liability it exists for real so if i have let's let's say i am the management so if i have recognized four properties or four plants i am going to claim that yes all those four properties yes or all, all those four plants they do exist so this is what what do I, what do we mean by existence number second valuation so let's say i am the management and if i have prepared the statement of financial position i'm going to claim so all those assets liabilities or capital which i have recognized within the statement of financial position they are neither overstated nor understated so i'm going to claim that the financial statements to be precise statement of financial position all those items are valued at the correct value so this is something which the management is going to claim number third the management is going to claim there is no liability which i have missed out everything is complete so if there were five liabilities i have recorded all five if there if there were five assets i have recorded all five so completeness means the management is going to claim that they have not missed out anything their ingredients the assets the liabilities the capital everything is complete so basically the completeness is the exact opposite of existence when it comes to existence the management is going to claim whatever we have recorded it exists for real and when it comes to completeness they will say whatever exists in real we have recorded it so the procedure for existence could be the opposite of completeness the procedure for completeness could be the opposite of the procedure of existence so it's the other way around because the concept is other way around last but surely not the least all those assets should be the ownership of the company all those liabilities should be the ownership of the company so the word rights and obligations the word rights has got to do with the assets the word obligation has got to do with the liabilities so this is it existence valuation completeness rights and obligations the management is going to claim that the statement of financial position has got all four ingredients and all four characteristics in it all the assets do exist all the liabilities are valued at the correct amount all the liabilities have been recorded so they are complete 
and all the assets and the liabilities are the rights and obligations that is the ownership of the company normally speaking normally speaking the company might recognize or the management might recognize an asset which does not exist for real the company might recognize recognize an asset at a value which is not the true or the fair value they might overstate the valuation of the assets they might understate the valuation of the liabilities they might recognize an asset they might recognize an asset which does not exist for real they might not want to recognize a liability which exists for real but they might not want to recognize it so they will compromise on com on completeness when it comes to liabilities so normally speaking when it comes to assets when it comes to assets existence is at stake when it comes to liabilities completeness is at stake and when it comes to valuation both the assets and the liabilities could be at stake is this clear e v c r are you all clear can i have confirmation on that okay okay sir musavir has raised a question sir why we don't verify the accuracy in statement of financial position okay musavir the word valuation and the word accuracy are literally the same but we tend to use the word valuation for the sake of statement of financial position items and we tend to use the word accuracy for the transactions that is the profit or loss account items is this clear is this clear to you musavir so when it comes to valuation and okay that's great musavir is clear okay the next question is from prashant patel and the question is can you explain completeness one more time okay just imagine i have to pay my trade payables are 5 and i need to pay 1 million to each maybe i have recorded 4 and maybe i have omitted 1 so what do i call it do those four liabilities four payables exist yes they exist in fact there is one more the fifth one it exists as well but i have not recognized it within my current liabilities as a trade payable so it's a compromise on completeness the fifth liability exists but i have not recorded it so it's a compromise on completeness completeness means you should recognize everything which deserves to be recognized you can't omit it you can't skip it is this clear patel completeness okay that's great patel okay ali hader has raised a question are we supposed to confirm the assertions made by the management absolutely yes the management is going to prepare the financial statements and they are going to claim a thing called assertion or assertions as an auditor i will apply my procedures like which which are called aeiou and i need to verify those assertions the story is very simple so one party is going to claim the assertions the other party is going to verify the assertions how does that sound is this clear well the disclosures are all over the place mn so disclosures are part of it so considering disclosures are part of the disclosures are part of the financial statements so we will always look up to the disclosures so if we have got a chance to to apply procedures on the provisions we will look into the you know disclosure just to make sure that the disclosure is adequate and in line with is 37 so if we are discussing something relevant to is 16 property plant equipment let's say about the revaluation or the depreciation at the end of the day we'll look up to the disclosures and make sure it it is in line with i16 property plan equipment okay uh well terin classification is part of the procedures so definitely we'll look up to the classification as well because but it's not that complicated 
we just need to make sure the liabilities are are split into you know current and non current liability the expenses are correctly classified into you know cost of sales and other expenses no big deal uh not exactly existence and completeness are not the same uh existence and occurrence are same give me give me few minutes i need to go into the profit and loss account assertions wait a second yes classification can also be part of the statement of financial position for example you need to make sure you split the current liability and non current liability appropriately you need to make sure you split the share capital and share premium appro appropriately Okay, Anshira has asked a wonderful question. How are these assertions going to be tested in exam? Anshira, if you really want to need, if you really want to know the answer, well, you got to wait for another two hours. After two hours, phrase this question all over again. Is this clear? Okay then. So I'm done with the first part of the assertions. That is. The statement of financial position. Let's continue with the assertion part two, which is about the statement of profit or loss account. So just imagine I am the management of a company and I have prepared the profit or loss account, sales, cost of sales, all those expenses, gross profit, net profit, and all that stuff. Now I'm going to claim that I've not missed out any item. So my profit or loss account items are complete. I've not omitted anything. Normally speaking, the management is not going to omit the revenue. They might omit the expenses in order to boost the profit. Number second assertion. As a management, I will claim I have not recorded anything fake in it. So everything which have been recognized by the management within the profit or loss account, it actually occurred during the year. So the word occurrence is is a you know twin sibling of the word existence but the word existence is used for the statement of financial position item because the assets or the liabilities need to exist at a particular date that is the statement of financial position date that is the reporting date of the client but the profit or loss account items they need to occur the transaction has to happen during the year so we don't call it existence we call it occurrence so the profit and loss account items, maybe it's a revenue, it's a purchase, it's a sale. It has to occur at some point of time during the year. So word occurrence is more or less like the word existence, but you have to use the word carefully. Number third and one of the most important, one of the most important and the famous assertion is called cut off. Now, if I am part of the management, I might want to recognize the revenue which does not belong to this year. Maybe I actually received the order during the current accounting period, but I dispatch the goods in the next accounting period. Let's assume few dates. So maybe your accounting period end is let's say 30th April and you receive the order from the customer on 25th April, but you dispatch the goods on 5th May. So According to the accounting rules, you need to recognize the revenue in the next accounting period, but the management might want to recognize the revenue in this accounting period. This is a mistake with, with respect to cutoff. Cutoff means you need to recognize the items in the correct accounting period. So this is something we call cut off. Classification, definitely it is part of the profit or loss account assertion. You need to make sure you are classifying the expenses in the correct families last but surely not the least what if i have recognized the revenue from a particular customer yeah the transaction did happen the customer did contact within this accounting period so this there is no issue on completeness yes it's a it's a real transaction so there is no there is no shadow of doubt on occurrence yes we need to recognize it within this period yes cutoff is not an issue yes yes it's a normal transaction we need to recognize it as a revenue classification is not an issue what if I recognize the revenue at an at an inflated amount? What if I recognize the expense or a liability or a you know expense at at, at an understated amount? So we call it accuracy. We need to make sure we are recognizing the transactions at the correct value. 
So I'm not going to use the word valuation because the word valuation has got to do with the statement of financial position. Rather, I'm going to use the word accuracy for the profit or loss account items. Is this clear to everyone? So these are the assertions which we need to verify. Okay, let me check. Sir, in AEIOU, we inspect and in controls, we also inspect. Yeah, when it comes to procedures, we the test of controls are also from, we will apply inspection to the, you know, reports in order to verify whether control is operating effectively or not. So don't think about the test of controls now. Is it possible to continue the audit process without management assertion? I didn't get this question. If the management is not claiming the assertions, the audit cannot be executed at all. Okay. Uh, okay, Musafir Hussain is saying all set. And Bhumika is saying, sir, please can you explain cutoff and classification again? Cutoff means you need to recognize the transactions in the correct accounting period. That's it. And the classification means you need to recognize the items in the correct families. For example, you cannot recognize a particular expense as other expense or as an administration expense if it is a cost of sale item. So correct family. Sonika, what was your question? I missed it. Shit. Sonika, can you please repeat your question? Okay, Bhumika, are you clear? Okay, Tarim is saying, can you please repeat occurrence? Occurrence and existence are more or less same. When it comes to existence, the management is going to claim that as at the reporting date, that is the statement of financial position date, that particular asset or that particular liability exists. But when it comes to but when it comes to occurrence, the management is going to claim that those transactions did happen during the year. So the liabilities or the assets has to exist at a particular date, but the profit or loss account items have to happen. They, they, they should have happened during the year at some point of time. Is this clear to you now, Tareem? No, Sonika, correct accounting period relates to the cut off. It's not about accuracy. Accuracy means that amount should be recorded within the profit or loss account at the correct, you know, amount, the value, the, the numbers should be correct. Jamil Shehzad has raised a question. Can, can, can I use cutoff assertion receivable and payable? Well, it, primarily it's about the revenue, which leads to the receivable. Primarily it's about the purchases, which leads to the payables. So normally speaking, I would go for the cutoff testing with respect to the purchases and the revenue, which automatically leads to the receivables and payables as well. Is this clear? Okay, Anshira is not absolutely clear with respect to completeness when it comes to statement of profit or loss account. So now imagine there are five expenses and you have recorded four. So now think about the assertions. Coca, are you have you recorded all five transactions? No, it means your profit or loss account is not complete. What do you mean by inventory in transit? Well, in general, anything which is in transit means it has not reached the final destination. So just imagine you are going to order a pizza for yourself. And if you are going to make a call to the pizza shop after half an hour that I have not received the pizza as yet, where is it? They might say, well, it's, 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 it's in the oven. Or they might say, sir, it's on the way. The rider is on the way. You have to hang on. So it's in transit. So if inventory is in transit, 
it could possibly mean that okay fine the goods have been dispatched from the store but they have not been received by the customer as yet or maybe it's the other way around the goods have been dispatched by your supplier but you have not actually received them you have not actually received it as yet so this is what we call goods in transit so this is it a e i o u and we need to verify two things either the e v c r or the kokum last thing before we move on to the past paper question before we will have we will definitely have a break before that okay the last thing is okay we need to apply a e i o u why we need to apply a e i o u because the management is claiming something and we need to verify that claim that's what we are paid for that this is the objective of the auditor at the end of the day you are going to draft an auditor's report you are going to come up with the audit opinion which is an important topic for your double a which i'm going to teach you tomorrow so you are going to verify the assertions but how are you going to verify the assertions you are going to verify the assertions with the help of evidence if you are going to get the evidence you as an auditor you will feel confident now how are you going to get the evidence well you will get the evidence with the help of the directors remember you are going to inquire from the directors you are going to understand what assumptions they have made you are going to understand what methodology they have used you will make sure their assumptions and their methodologies are reasonable and in line with the industry practice or in line with the said or the applicable accounting standards so we need to interact with the directors in order to get the evidence we'll have a discussion with the directors we'll have a discussion we'll will will inquire the directors so discussion or inquire is one and the same thing will inspect the assets in order to verify do they really exist what's their physical condition what's their physical location so we need to inspect the assets we need to inspect the property we need to inspect the plant we need to inspect the you know machinery we need to inspect the inventory itself but we can't inspect the receivables we can't inspect the bank on cash balance because we need to inspect the tangible asset so assets are a valuable source of evidence how are we going to get the evidence there are many documents which are a valuable source of evidence so we'll look into the documents such as the purchase invoice such as the loan agreement if 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 you are having a discussion on the bonus scheme i might want to review the contract or the contractual terms and conditions of the employee the contractual agreement of the employees if i'm looking forward to the you know if i'm auditing a share issue i might want to look at the company's constitution the company's article of association in order to understand what is the applicable accounting treatment when it comes to a right issue or a bonus issue so the documents are extremely important source of evidence for the auditor all over the all over the world number 4 those accounting books and records such as the sales day book most importantly the cash day book all those accounting books all those reconciliations all those those trial balance and the statement financial position all those items are also a valuable source of evidence last but surely not the least the third parties are a valuable source of evidence such as the bank of my audit client such as the lawyer of my audit client the debtors the payables the lease provider the insurance provider and the story goes on so as an auditor you need to collect evidence so that you could conclude those evidence so that you could come up with a conclusion so that you could come up with an audit report and within the audit report you could express your opinion which the members or the shareholders of the company are looking forward to how are you going to you know come up with the conclusion you are going to extract or you are going to get the evidence and in order to get the evidence as a student as an auditor you need to look up to these things called da da 3 so the bottom line is very much straightforward and very much simple we need to apply a e i o u we need to learn those ingredients we need to use the word the the phrase called or the mnemonic called da da 3 that that's going to give me the you know ideas and i need to apply either the evcr or the coca and this will give me nice and easy one mark and let me repeat 
the bottom line once more if you could assure me or yourself that you are damn good with respect to this topic called substantive procedure and you are damn good with respect to the topic called otqs that is the section a of your exam you you can pass this paper with a poor number such as 50 or 55 but you cannot fail this exam so with this beautiful note it's the one hour of the session and i think we should have a little break for five to ten minutes because after the break we need to start past paper questions and i will try to cover as many questions as we can and definitely within those questions which we are going to cover tonight one one of the question will be from the most recent past paper that is the march june 2022 apart from that we skipped the parts from on the day one relevant to the substantive procedures and i think we skipped a part yesterday as well or probably or, or i guess nothing yesterday so we are going to cover those parts as well so this is it if you have got any questions for now please raise your questions otherwise we'll have a break for five to ten minutes no i can't make the break for 15 minutes because i need to give another break at around seven so i can't give the 15 minute break 10 minute break now 10 minute break later happy story yes miss Sixena, you are absolutely right one recommendation will give you one mark one test of control will give you one mark one substantive procedure will give you one mark yes Hira, presentation is also one of the assertion but don't worry about it mahad sir are cats relevant cats means computer assisted audit techniques so you could perform your procedures with the help of software So you could apply substantive procedures with the help of software. This is it for now. I can't go into the detail. Sir, explain the difference between occurrence and accuracy. Well, there is no there is no confusion between occurrence and accuracy. Occurrence and the alternative word for occurrence is existence. So all the assets liabilities should exist at the balance sheet date, and all the profit and loss account items such as revenue expenses should have happened during the year accuracy means the value of the the amount should be correct when it comes to profit or loss account the the corresponding word in the statement of financial position for the accuracy is valuation all those items should be valued at correct amount again amount are you clear milan well we can use cats along with aiou but cat is not going to come up with anything new with the help of CAD, you are going to recalculate. With the help of CAD, you are going to, you know, you are going to seek the written representation or maybe a third party confirmation. So CAD is nothing new. CAD is part of AEIOU. And you are going to use CAD only if the question says so. Otherwise, no. Umar, uh, the, like, the link for the last two classes of Azan, the li link for the last class is available in the WhatsApp group. Don't worry. Yes, Umar, don't you can share it with me. Don't worry. And the link for the yesterday's class is available in your WhatsApp group. Don't worry, I'll share it again. OK, now it's time to have a break. And after the break, hang on because we are going to explore the past paper questions relevant to the substantive procedures. Thank you.
Okay, then now it's time to start the past paper questions relevant to the substantive procedures. So. Don't forget we need to apply a E I O U. We need to apply a E I O U. And we need to verify the assertions called EVCR or data three uh, uh, assertions EVCR or COCA. And we need to get the evidence with the help of a thing called data three. So the first question which I have got for you is as we promised on the day one. This is from March June 2022. And if you remember, we did the first part relevant to the preconditions, the second part relevant to the uh, ratios, then the preconditions. Then we had to identify and explain eight audit risk along with the responses. Okay. What about party? Yeah, we skipped the party, and the party is describe substantive procedures. The auditor should perform to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence in relation to the company's trade receivables. Now we need to apply substantive procedures in order to verify the company's year end trade receivables. Okay, now now I'm straight away thinking about a E I O U. Moreover, I'm thinking about B A T A three data three and most importantly, now I am thinking about EVCR. Now, why I'm thinking about EVCR and I'm not thinking about COCA, that is C O double C A, because receivables is the statement of financial position item. So I need to think about the EVCR. Now, dear students, this question had you know nothing to do. This particular exam requirement had not had nothing to do with the question itself, but there was a bit of a story relevant to the receivables and this is the story. The manager in e companies credit control department has been off work. Since December 20X4 due to ill health and has been replaced by an inexperienced temporary manager. As a result, the company has not been monitoring the aging of its receivable. So now think about the aging of receivable, and that reminds me of a thing called age receivable analysis or an age receivable listing. And any follow up on outstanding invoices when the system alerts the credit control that a customer invoice has been outstanding for 90 days or more. So I'm thinking about the receivables could be overvalued because maybe. Certain receivables have actually gone bad and the company might not be able to receive the corresponding cash, but still they have recognized it as a receivable. The standard credit terms are just 30 days and they are chasing the debtors of 90 days or more. So that creates a huge doubt on the valuation of receivables. So most importantly, I need to apply procedures on the valuation of the receivable because I believe certain receivables might be, you know, you know they might have gone bad and when I'm thinking about bad debts, I'm straight away thinking about the allowance for the doubtful debt as well. When I'm thinking about the receivable, my mind tells me that what if there are certain receivables having some kind of dispute with the client? So I might need to review the correspondence between those debtors and my audit client. Maybe for a particular customer, I might need to review the board minutes of the meetings. So this is what I'm thinking. Okay, so my procedures are A E I O U. Let's forget about the data three. Let's forget about the EVCR. Let's talk about A E I O U. What was A? Well, the A means comparisons, right? So yes, you can compare the year end receivable with the last year especially on a month by month basis. And you will realize there is a significant fluctuation because the question says so. So I think you should not apply this analytical procedure over here because one would already expect the 
year end receivables to be higher as compared to the last year because the financial controller got ill okay inquiries can we can we have any kind of discussion with the management yes we can have a discussion with the management regarding the receivables which are extraordinary age before we, before we do that discussion i need to inspect and review the age receivable listing and i need to figure out certain receivables which are having extraordinary age and maybe i need to have discussion with the management that they need to write it off moreover i need to review or i need to have discussion with the management regarding the allowance for the doubtful debt maybe the allowance for the doubtful debt is not appropriate and it's not in line with the industry average or it's not in line with the company situation maybe you would like to review the post year and bank statement and cash day book in a e i o u you, you would like to inspect the post year and bank statement and cash day book in order to verify whether those receivables which were recognized at the year end have now been converted into cash or not so you would like to inspect what do you want to expect the post year and bank statement and cash day book right so these are basically documents and why would you why would you want to inspect them because you want to confirm whether the receivables have now been converted into cash or not so what about third parties you can yes you can review the correspondence between the major receivables especially having an extraordinary age and your client called s company just to confirm whether if there is any dispute going on and if there is any dispute you need to have discussion with the management regarding the you know regarding the allowance for the doubtful debt or maybe they need to write it off a e i o u can you recalculate anything yes you can obtain the breakdown of the year end receivable cast it and make sure there is no arithmetical mistake make sure the valuation and completeness is correct and make sure you the, the amount agrees with the trial balance and with the statement of financial position so these are the procedures which comes in my mind with the help of a e i o u if i am going to think with respect with respect to data 3 directors can i have some kind of discussion with directors yes regarding the age of the receivable regarding the need to write them off directors can i review the board minutes of the meetings of the directors so these are two different procedures da da 3 accounting books and records yes i could get the breakdown of the year end receivable from the statement of financial position and i could cast it to make sure there is no you know problem with respect to completeness and valuation and i would agree it with the trial balance and with the statement of financial position da da 3 documents so yes you could select a sample of pre year end and post year end good dispatch notes make sure they have recognized the year end receivables according to the good dispatch notes which were which belong to the pre year end similarly you can inspect the post year end credit notes and you can agree them or you can trace them make sure that the corresponding revenue and the receivables have not been recognized by the company da da 3 you can apply or you can go for the third party confirmation and we call it receivable circularization so i will select a sample of year end receivables and i will write letters to them and i will confirm the year end balances from the receivables themselves so this is what we call da da 3 last but not the least if you are running short of ideas think which family does receivable belongs to well it belongs to evcr so can you apply any procedure on existence yes select a sample of receivable select a sample from the year end receivable now you want to verify whether that receivable exists or not check out the corresponding or agree the corresponding sales order agree the corresponding good dispatch note if everything is there it means that receivable literally exists it's it, it was not fake e with er how could you verify the valuation select a sample of good dispatch note and the corresponding invoice and make sure that the correct amount has been recognized as a year end receivable that's how you verify the valuation for the valuation you could get the breakdown and cast it make sure everything is complete and valued appropriately e v c r in order to verify the completeness select a sample of 
a good dispatch note and make sure that you agree that good dispatch note with the sales order and you agree it with the year and receivable. Well, so maybe they have missed it out. So this is how we confirm the completeness. So this is it. Now before I go on to your questions, let's check it out what the solution by the examiner has to offer. So the first procedure is obtain a breakdown of the receivable list that is from the statement of financial position cast it that is add it up and then once you have added up agree the amount with the trial balance and the receivable ledger control account in order to make sure there is no mistake so this is a procedure for the completeness and most importantly valuation obtain the prior year age receivable listing and for significant customers, the important customer compared to the current year and the prior year balances. If there is any unusual fluctuation or significantly lower balances, or if a particular customer is has gone missing altogether, you need to have discussion with the management. You need to review the after date cash receipts. What do I mean by after date cash receipts? That is the post year end cash receipts make sure and follow through to the pre year and receivable balance make sure that those amounts were actually representing a particular receivable at the year end so it's it's about the completeness inspect the age receivable report to identify any slow moving balance discuss these with the credit control manager to assess whether an allowance or write down is necessary similarly for any slow moving or aged balance review customer correspondence so if a particular customer is having a slow or you know aged balance you need to review the customer correspondence maybe there is some kind of dispute going on and that is why that customer is not paying you paying the company review the minutes of the meetings maybe you will be able to figure out any significant cons concerns with respect to the recoverability of a particular receivable Select a sample of good dispatch notes from before the year end. Agree to the sales invoice and to inclusion in the receivable ledger. So, considering you have selected the sample before the year end, it should be recognized at the receivable. It should be recognized as a receivable at the year end. Review the receivable ledger for any credit balances because normally the receivable is an asset. So, normally they have got a debit balance. So, if there is any credit balance, it is an unusual situation and we need to have discussion with the management regarding the reclassification as a payable, not as a credit balance. Last but not, uh, well, second last, we need to review the customer correspondence to identify any balances which are in dispute or unlikely to be paid. And then we need to have discussion with the management regarding that. Last but not the least, we can recalculate the allowance for the trade ball receivables and compare it with the any potential irrecoverable balances. Maybe the allowance is not that significant and on the contrary, the actual bad debts are on a very higher side. So the allowance might not be adequate. So this is how we develop substantive procedures. If you're going to practice it, if you're going to type them again and again, you will be able to understand things. Okay. Okay, Shivani. Substantive procedures are normally tested in two ways by the AA examiner. When it comes to the risk question, the examiner would come up with a straightforward question without any scenario or without any storyline. But when it comes to the question three of the section B, the examiner would come up with a scenario with a story and I will explore questions such as those ones. But let's start from the simple one. Okay, MN has raised a question. In every procedure, it is compulsory to mention assertion name and wording used as like to ensure or to verify. Well, the basic answer or the first answer is yes. But sometimes your procedure is so clear 
that it's it is so obvious that what kind of assertion you are trying to verify if that is the case you don't need to mention the assertion but if it is not clear ideally speaking you should highlight which assertion you are trying to verify recalculate the age receivable days and compare with prior year and recalculate well, don't say recalculate. Calculate the age receivable days and compare it with the prior year. And if there's any significant fluctuation difference, and recalculate the receivable balance and compare it. Now, these are two different things, Alson. If you're if you're comparing the receivable balance for important customer with the last year, that's a different procedure. And if you're calculating the receivable collection period days and comparing it with the last year, that's a different one. Okay. Let's go to another question. So this question had nothing to do with substantive procedure. OK, so the next question is. Remember we did this question called. Heart and there were part A was about the benefits of audit planning. It was a bookish straightforward knowledge question. Then we had to describe eight audit risk. Then the party was about the conflict of interest. So we basically skipped the part C. What was part C? The part C was describe substantive procedures the auditor should perform to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence in relation to the director's bonuses. Five marks means five bonuses, uh, five procedures. What's the story? Is there any story? Well, there is nothing much to offer, but still, this is the story which you could possibly read. So the company's directors correctly disclose their remuneration details in the forecast financial statements in line with IFRS standards. However, local legislation in the country in which the company is based requires more extensive disclosure and the directors have stated that they consider this onerous and do not and so do not intend to provide the additional information. So you should focus on the disclosure notes especially with respect to the local laws and regulations. OK, what are we going to do? Well, first of all, I need to make sure that I am comfortable with the contractual terms and conditions of the directors in order to understand that the bonus is in line with their contractual terms. I need to review the constitution of the company in order to understand that the bonus is in line with the company's policy or the company's constitution. I need to make sure that the bonus was formally agreed collectively by the board of directors for that. I need to review the board minutes of the meetings. Maybe I would like to get the breakdown of the bonus. I need to cast it, make sure there is no arithmetical mistake and I need to agree it with the trial balance and with the you know relevant payroll accounts or the payroll ledger. Maybe for a particular director on a sample basis. I would recalculate the calculation of the bonus in accordance with the company's policy in accordance with the you know constitution of the company and in accordance with the policy or the approved bonus policy and I'll make sure that the same amount has been recognized in the payroll ledger and in the you know overall bonus amount. Last but surely not the least I need to review the disclosures and I need to make sure that the disclosures are in line and adequately disclosed in accordance with the local legislation. Is this clear to everyone? Can I have confirmation on that? Is this clear? What if question asks substantive procedures for completeness of receival? Yes. You could apply a completeness, but normally speaking, the examiner would ask for existence or valuation because normally the client Fatma, the client is not going to miss out any receivable. They will go for 
when when it comes to cheating when it comes to material misstatement they will they will make compromises on expenses for the completeness they will they would like to you know miss out a, a particular liability or an expense not for the assets or the revenue yes sir how can we remember these points using keywords okay let me help you with that first of all anshira try to understand that every time the answers would start with obtain a schedule of see when you were applying the procedures for the receivables dear students you have to concentrate this could be a very important turning point so when you were trying to when you were applying procedures on receivables how did you start obtain a breakdown of the receivable listing now you are applying procedures on what director's bonus you are saying obtain a schedule of the director's bonus and cast the schedule to ensure its accuracy and then agree the amount with the amount disclosed in the financial statement so it's more or less the same thing it's more or less the same thing let me give you another demo i'm not trying to confuse you here i'm trying to ease things the next question which i'm going to start with you from march june 2022 the first part is describe substantive procedures on the revenue now check out the solution revenue 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 spinach company over here cast a breakdown of revenue and agree the amount with general ledger trial balance in the draft financial statement how does that sound i'm trying to perform the u the recalculation out of aeiou how i'm going to get the evidence from the accounting books and records what i'm trying to do i'm trying to verify the valuation or the accuracy moreover the completeness as well how does that sound are you clear what i'm trying to do over here is this clear the, what what the what the connection with which i was trying to build are you clear with it okay anshara is getting my point jameel i can't answer that now because but in the book you will get everything for now concentrate on the lecture okay fatma is saying yes it's building up see fatma and everyone out there i don't have the recipe to build up like that but i do have the recipe to slowly and surely build up the things you will start realizing that all over the world the the auditors are more or less applying the same thing with a little bit of twist and turns so let me build up slowly so you are trying to verify the director's bonus you are trying to verify the year end receivable you are trying to verify the year end revenue one thing is same you are getting the breakdown and you are comparing it or agreeing it with certain things now you need to understand those three procedures which i just highlighted for you and you need to practice them you need to learn them okay let's continue don't use whatsapp right now please stick to the lecture okay now where were where were we uh yeah we were discussing oh we were on heart yeah yeah so we were having a discussion on the director's bonus and let's about let's talk about the second procedure for example you are going to select one individual out of out of so many directors so agree the individual bonus payment to the post year and payroll records make sure the same amount which was agreed for a particular individual is part of the payroll record review the schedule of current liabilities and confirm that the bonus accrual is included what if the client has not recognized it as a accrual because they have to pay the bonus after the year end they have not paid it as yet so they need to recognize it as an accrual 
because they need to come up with certain calculations and then the amount would be finalized so just review the accruals make sure they this is part of the accrual for example out of so many directors well i've selected one director called fatma and i'm going to recalculate the bonus payment recalculate the bonus payment and agree the criteria to supporting documents such as the director service contract make sure that the bonus is in line with the service contract make sure the bonus is not overstated not understated okay moreover confirm the amounts of the bonuses with the post year and bank statement and cash day book make sure if the bonus was recognized as 2 million the bank statement and cash day book is reflecting 2 million the bank statement and cash day book should not reflect 2.5 million the bank statement and cash day book should not reflect 1.5 million moreover review the board minutes to identify whether any additional payments relating to this year have been agreed for any director maybe for a particular director some additional amount have been paid what if that's in that's a cheating what if that's a material misstatement what if that is not that was not agreed so i need to review the board minutes for that i could obtain the written representation in this case from the management that make that please write it up for me give me the written representation that the director's remuneration it includes the bonus and it's complete and you have not missed out anything last but not the least you will review the disclosures made by the client in relation to the bonus make sure that it is in line with the local legis legislation along with the ifrs are you clear with the with respect to the procedures can i move on to another question okay so you so we are done with two questions let's move to another question wait a second and that question would be from the march june 2022 the latest paper and finally we will be done with this paper right because remember we did the first question called s company on risk then we did this question on controls called wit taker which was about sales system payroll system bank system finally we are heading towards the last question called spinach company and it's a question focusing on substantive procedure so let's talk about the part a describe the substantive procedures the auditor should perform to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence in relation to the company's revenue five marks so we need five procedures okay it is first july 20x5 and you are an audit supervisor with sweet corn and company and you are responsible for the final audit because it's the procedure stage for your existing client called spinach company which is due to commence in september spinach company is a listed company which manufactures garden furniture its draft financial statements for the year ending 31st july 20x5 shows revenue of 65.1 million and profit before tax of 18.2 million the following matters have been brought to your attention so this is the story relevant to revenue spinach company's revenue is generated through sales to individual customers via its website and sale to wholesale customer such as garden centers and stores okay so price increases in line with inflation were applied across all products in september 20x4 at the start of the year basically spinach company successfully launched three new product lines in february 20x5 that is during the year wholesale customer placed their orders on credit via company's web uh, via company's sales ordering department individual customer placed their order online and immediately pay the full amount owing the goods are normally dispatched within the 7 days of the customer placing the order so the goods are dispatched within the 7 days so there i would like to select a sample of pre year end and post year end good dispatch notes and then i need to follow up and agree with the year end revenue so those belongs to the pre year end should be recognized as the current year revenue and those who belong from the post year end should not be recognized as a year end revenue so that's my procedure number 2 why i am saying procedure number 2 because the first procedure was to get the breakdown number third procedure 
you need to review the post year and credit notes and follow them up. Make sure that the company has not recognized or the company has removed it, the corresponding transactions or the invoices from the current year's revenue. Because if the credit note has been issued, that should not be recognized as a year end revenue. So, procedure number three A E I O U A analytical. Yes, compare the company's year end revenue, maybe on a product by product basis, maybe on a month by month basis, maybe on an important customer by customer basis with the last year. And if there is any particular fluctuation, except for those three new products launched, you need to have further discussion with the management. Number fourth, A E I O U inquiries. Can I have some kind of discussion with the management? Yes. You need to review the correspondence between the, you know, company's important customers or the and the client. Maybe there is some kind of dispute, and the corresponding revenue needs to be written off. So it's more like receivables. And similarly, A E I O U inspection. Any document? Yeah, I've, I've already inspected the. Post year end and pre year end good dispatch note. Okay, revenue is part of the profit or loss account. So, what assertions are we talking here? Coca, completeness. So, you can select the sample of pre year end and post year end good dispatch note for the cutoff. Well, what about occurrence and what about completeness? So, what about occurrence and what about completeness? So you could select a sample of good dispatch node and trace it with the, you know, with the invoice and make sure it is in, make sure it has been recorded as a revenue. So that confirms the completeness. And if you are going to go other way around, select the sample from the year end revenue, trace it, Compare it with the sales invoice and make sure that the corresponding good dispatch note is there. So that that verifies the that verifies the uh, if you are going to select the sample from the revenue and if you are going to match it with the good dispatch note that verifies the occurrence. And if you are going to select a sample from the good dispatch note and you are going to compare it, match it within the year end revenue that verifies the completeness. So this is it. You need five. We have explored four or five. Let's read the solution. So the first procedure was a simple one: cast a breakdown of revenue and agree it with the general ledger, trial balance, and the draft financial statement. Compare the overall level of revenue against the prior year, or maybe with the budget. And if there is any significant fluctuation, so this is recalculation. The first one, and the second one is what? This is analytical procedure. You could opt also obtain the breakdown of sales analyzed by a month by month basis and compare this with the prior year. Again, if there is any significant fluctuation, compare analytical procedure. Obtain a schedule of sales for the year disaggregated into the main product or maybe on a customer by customer basis. Again, if there is any unusual fluctuation, you could apply, you can have a discussion with the management. So there are three analytical procedures. Then what? For a sample of invoices, recalculate the invoices, especially with respect to discounts and sale tax. Make sure there is no arithmetical mistake. Select the sample of credit notes. Make sure that the revenue has been removed from the year end revenue. Select a sample of dispatch notes, both pre and post year end. Make sure that the cutoff has not been compromised. Select a sample of dispatch notes and agree it to the sales invoice and inclusion into the sale day book that verifies the completeness of revenue. And if you are going to select a sample of sample from the revenue from the year end revenue and you are going to match it with the invoice through to the good dispatch note that verifies the occurrence. So is this clear to everyone? Is this clear to everyone? Well, the dispatch note is an important thing when it comes to revenue. So if you are going to select a sample of good dispatch notes from the year end 
and you are going to match it with the invoice with the original customer order and finally within the revenue that confirms the completeness of revenue because you selected the sample of good dispatch note so you are trying to make sure they have completely recorded the revenue but if you are going to select the sample from the year end revenue and you are going to match it with the invoice and finally to the good dispatch note that verifies the occurrence so it's the other way around so fatma is clear Brianna is clear. Naila is clear. Tareem is clear. Oh, thank you very much, Fatima. Sheet to floor and float to sheet. Yes. If I am going to select a sample from the profit or loss account, that is from the revenue, one of the sample, it means I'm looking forward. I want to confirm the good dispatch note. And if I will be able to get the good dispatch note, that confirms that the transaction was not fake. It actually occurred. But if I'm going to select the sample from the bloody good dispatch note, it's already there. The occurrence is not at stake. Now I need to make sure they have recognized it as a revenue. So it's about the completeness. Flow to sheet, sheet to flow. Yes, source document to ledger and ledger to document. Well done, Imran Ali. Thank you. Most welcome, Mahad. Washington is clear, Naila is clear, Imran is clear. Yes, MN is clear. Don't call it existence because it's a profit or loss account item. Call it occurrence and completeness. If it would have been a statement of financial position item, I would have said existence and completeness. Ibrahim has asked a question. If goods are not disp dispatched by the year end, can we still record it as a revenue? Everyone out there, can you answer the Ibrahim's question? If the goods are not dispatched by the year end, we actually record, we actually received the order, but we didn't dispatch. Can we can we recognize it as a year end revenue? Imran is saying no, Naila is saying no. No, 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 too many no's. Absolutely, I'm loving those no's. Normally we don't like no, right? But I, right as of now, I, I'm liking those no's. Well, my dear, uh, who raised that question? Short term memory problem, yeah. We cannot recognize that particular transaction at at the year end as a revenue because according to ifrs 15 we have not transferred the economic benefits to the end user so we cannot recognize the revenue okay can we talk about anything related to board minutes well when it comes to revenue we can review the board minutes in order to understand what exactly the price increase they had a discussion and they finalized and then i will compare and then i will align it or agree it with the invoices because according to the question they actually raised the invoices in re with respect to inflation or something so i could review the board minutes for that no no we should record it no we cannot record it as a deferred liability we haven't earned anything we haven't received anything ibrahim what are you saying man you, you're not supposed to record anything. You just received an order. Be happy. Sleep tight. You can't make an entry for that. Once you will deliver the goods, then it's about generating an invoice and then you can recognize the revenue and the receivable both. Is this clear, Ibrahim? Okay, thank you. What about the cash received? How can you receive the cash when you have not, even when you have not, Deliver the goods. Well, if you are that lucky, okay, if you have received the cash in advance, you, then you need to recognize this as a liability, as a deferred income. Omar Hayat Khan is saying in test of controls, we also read the board of minutes. In substantive procedures, we also reading the board of minutes. Yes, the, but, but, the, but the agenda is different, right? In test of controls, I look forward to the good dispatch note. In substantive procedures, I'm looking forward to the good dispatch note, but the reason is different. When it comes to test of control, I was looking forward to make sure that the document is sequentially pre-numbered. 
I was looking forward to make sure. Yes, the Umar Hayat has signed the document, but now I'm trying to make sure that the good dispatch note, the corresponding revenue. Now I'm trying to verify the profit and loss account, the revenue. So the agenda is different. How does that sound to you, Umar? The reason of the action is completely different. Test of control means you are trying to verify whether the policy and procedures are being followed. Substantive procedure means you are trying to verify whether the amounts in the financial statement are correct or not. Okay, Omar, well done. So nice of you, Musafir. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, I just need one thing, and that is you need to work according to the instructions, and then you need to, you know, go as a happy child on Monday, 5th September 2022, and don't be afraid of anything. And, you know, and then enjoy your holidays. Okay, Brian is stuck somewhere if a customer pays the cash while ordering so we will definitely record that deferred income as liability sir as per ifrs 15 absolutely yes yes you're right fantastic because ifrs 15 will not allow you to recognize it as a revenue as of now so it's not about ifrs 15 ifrs 15 will not allow you to recognize it as a revenue Ibrahim, are you clear? Can we move on, Ibrahim? Yeah, when get, do we use? Well, they, they have got different sources of income, so we need to make sure they have recognized it, you know, as a revenue. If they have, well, classification is not a major issue as, as of now. Shivani, we have to make sure that the procedure makes sense with respect to scenario. Anshira, well, I would say ignore it. But if you are going to insist, okay, if you if you insist, basically, Brian was trying to make a point that if some if a company has received an order from a customer along with the cash, well, that sounds beautiful for the company because the company has not delivered the goods, but they have received the received the cash. How the accounting treatment would, would, would you know what would what would be the accounting treatment? Well, the company should not recognize it as a revenue because they have not transferred the obligation. So they will recognize it as a deferred income. They will recognize it as a liability. But once they will, you know, they will meet the criteria of revenue recognition according to IFRS 15, which you should not worry a lot about it. Then they will make the dual entry. And they will transfer it and they will recognize it as a revenue. Anjara, are you clear now? And okay, that's great. So we are done with the first part. Now let's have the final break. Yes, it's then the final break, as you all are referring to. So it's 7 p.m. right now. Let's be back at 7 10 p.m. sharp after exactly 10 minutes. And we'll continue with this March, June 2022. And the part B, which I'm about to start, is going to be really important and really tricky one. So hang on and I'll see you in 10 minutes. So you didn't answer my query of physician specific question. How, how to attempt it easily, sir? Musafir, take, but, but, well, give me a few, few, well, let's let's be patient with the passage of time. You will be able to understand things. Otherwise, at the end of the session, you need to raise the question all over again. OK, I'll see you after 10 minutes. 710.
Okay, guys. Now it's time to finish off this paper called March June 2022, and we have already covered the part A, which was about revenue, which was about the profit or loss account item. Let's go to the part B and C. Now the part B says describe the audit procedures the auditor should perform as part of the audit of the spinach company before and during the inventory count. So what procedures or what actions you are going to take before the stock count before the inventory count? Well, what I'm supposed to do what, what I'm supposed to do before the stock count? Well, first of all, I need to know which warehouses or which places are having the most material items so that I could make sure that I'll be there. Secondly, I need to review the last year's audit file again in order to understand which warehouses or which place was having certain kind of problems so that I could visit them at any cost because they could still have problems. Third, I need to have discussion with the management and I need to understand what they believe which particular warehouse or you know place are having the greatest material amount or the, are having the greatest problems again so that I could visit that particular place. There are always a thing called inventory count instructions for the teams. So I need to review and I need to understand those inventory count instructions in order to understand the inventory count instructions are clear and they have got no problem within them. So these are the procedures which I could perform before going on to the stock count. What about during those inventory count? A, I need to observe that the teams are working, you know, as per the plan, as per the instructions. B, I need to make sure if there are any faulty items, damaged items, third party items. Now for that, we need to read the question. We need to make sure they are properly being flagged and separated. We need to make sure there is a proper mechanism in order to quantify the valuation of the damaged items. So these are the procedures which we are going to apply during the count. So before the count during the count the marks are six. So you could easily split three three. Let's read the question. S company is forecasting a year end inventory balance of 9.3 million. So that sounds extremely material. The company undertakes continuous production. So the production goes on and on and full year and inventory counts will be carried out at the year end. That is on 31st July. As companies raw materials and finished goods inventory are stored in six warehouses which are located across the country. See six warehouses. So it might not be possible for the audit team to attend all six. The company has one factory site and it is expected that there will be no significant work in progress held at the year end. So you can you can ignore the factory. Each inventory count will be supervised by a member of the company's internal audit department. There will be no movement of goods in and out of the warehouse during the count. So you need to observe that during the count. Sweet corn, which is the name of the audit firm will only attend some of the counts. So it's not possible for you to attend all the counts. So before the count, you need to figure out which places or which warehouses out of the six you need to be there. You need to visit the largest warehouse. Oh, that's that's an important one. The largest warehouse is located at the factory site. So it's it's within the factory and around 10% of this warehouse space is rented out to a third party company which stores its inventory of cleaning products there. So you need to make sure what kind of products do they make? So they make garden furniture. So you need to make sure that the third party items are separate and it's not, you know, amalgamated or mixed. The finance director has explained that the third party inventory is located in one specific area of the warehouse. So you need to visit that place as well during the count. So I think this is not a difficult question. So these are the procedures before the count and these are the procedures during the count. One, two, three, four, five. There are five before the count. You don't need five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight up during the count. You don't need eight. You just need three each. Okay. Review the prior year audit files. Why? Because I want to identify the problem child 
from the last year. Is this clear? The first procedure have a discussion with the management. Why? Because you want to know the significant changes which have occurred or any particular warehouse experiencing significant control issues. So what for that I need to have discussion with the management. Then you need to decide as an auditor which warehouse is having the most material item so that you could be there. Last but not the least before we go on to the way for the stock count. We might want to have discussion with the management regarding the third party and make sure they have they make sure uh, what and, and I need to understand what mechanism and what procedure they have in place in order to make sure that the third party items are not incorporated at the year end stock count. What about during the count a observe the teams whether the instructions are being followed or not. Maybe you could observe the counts in order to confirm that the procedure for segregating the damage items or the slow moving items are being followed or not. Maybe you would like to have the discussion with the internal audit supervisor in order to verify how they would quantify the work in progress or what methodologies they are going to use. Well, you can obtain the copy of the completed sequential number inventory sheets. Make sure there is no sheet gone missing. Last but not the least observe the procedures that they have carried out in order to make sure that the third party items have been you know separately allocated to a one particular area. Is this clear to everyone? Another procedure obtain a copy of the last GRN and the last GDN make sure they have correctly recognized it make sure they have not compromised on the cut off. Okay, there is a question from Shahzadi. Shahzadi, before you wrap up, wrap up today's session, kindly brief us on the difference between the three major topics. Okay, I might forget it, so you have to remind me again after half an hour or so. Okay, rest everyone is clear. That's great. So let's explore the last part of this question. And the last part of this question is about the share capital. So what about share capital? Describe the substantive procedures the auditor should perform to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence in relation to the company's issue of share capital. So the company has issued a certain amount of share capital. Let's see what the question has to say. The company is looking to expand its operation by securing an additional factory site. So company wants to buy an additional factory in order to raise finance. In order to raise sufficient capital in order to you know finance the company has issued ordinary shares at a premium in May raising a sum of 4.3 million. What does premium means? Premium means share capital and also share premium account. So what procedures we are looking at? I think first of all we need to obtain the share issue document in order to understand the details of it and make sure the accounting treatment and the disclosures are in line with it with it. We need to split the share capital and share premium. Make sure that the correct accounting treatment have been adopted by the client. We need to. Uh, we need to review the disclosure notes in order to make sure that the overall transaction have been appropriately disclosed in accordance with the relevant laws and regulations. Well, we can review the board minutes in order to confirm whether the additional share issue was agreed and the price was appropriate. So review the board minutes. Why? In order to confirm the number of shares and the price. Most importantly, agree the issue of shares in accordance with the company's constitution. Review the legal documentation in order to identify the details of the share issue. Inspect the bank statement and cash book in order to verify whether the same amount has been received. Recalculate the split of the proceeds between the nominal value and the premium. Make sure it is correctly classified within the share capital and share premium account. We know the nominal account goes 
as a credit in the share capital and the the, the premium is go the premium is classified as in the share premium account last but not the least review the disclosure of the share issue in the draft financial statement ensure it is in line with the relevant accounting standards and with the local laws and regulations so please read this procedures i'm giving you two three minutes relevant to share capital especially those which are highlighted agree the issue of new shares to the share register and tell me if you are not clear for a particular one Yes, ma'am, and you are absolutely right. Yes, Naila, you are absolutely right. In excess of par value goes to the share premium account. Yes, Saad Jangir, we can split it up. We can recalculate the split according to the share issue document, according to the inspect the cash book and you know and cash day book and the bank statement in order to verify the same amount has been received. Well done, well done. So please read all those procedures. Okay, should I move on to the next past paper question on substantive procedure? Can I have yes on that so that I could move? Okay, thank you, Fatima. And Shazadi, you, your question is still in, is in my in my mind. You have to remind me at the end of the session. I need to have a brief overview about the connection of these three topics called risk controls and procedures. In fact, I will give you a story about the whole syllabus of the double a starting from topic number one to topic number seven within five minutes sir on share issue which one is the one you said you do two ways either from i didn't i didn't get the, that question sorry sorry mate Okay, Nishika Saxena is saying, please explain the second procedure again. Okay. Yes, Bilal, I will definitely. That would be awesome. Okay, source to ledger. Okay, source to ledger. When it comes to statement of financial position, it's about existence and completeness. When it comes to profit or loss account, it's about occurrence and completeness. These are the things which you could do other way around. In the past paper solution, sometimes the assertion is not mentioned because the procedure is too obvious. Otherwise, normally you should come up with the assertion. Okay, procedure number two. Procedure number two, whatever shares they have issued, they cannot come up with anything not in line with the company's constitution. So I need to make sure that whatever shares they have issued, it is in line with the company's articles of association, which is called the constitution agreement. Is this clear? You could replace the word. You could use the word articles of association. Okay, what about recalculation? So you could recalculate the split of the share issue among the share capital and share premium. Now we must understand whenever a company issues a share and that too on a premium, the nominal value is credited in the share capital account and the premium over the nominal value. So if the nominal value of the share was dollar five, but you sold the shares at dollar seven. So the five dollar will go into the share capital, but the rest of the two dollar will go into the share premium account. Is this clear? So that's what the recalculation procedure is all about. Is this clear? Can I move on now? Okay then. Mahad, absolutely yes. 
if there are 10 10 procedures within the solution and the marks are four you need to come up with the best four with any four never overwrite once you are done with the full exam option number one try to have a chit chat with your neighbors if they are not interested first of all i'm sorry mate secondly yes then you can add on extra substantive procedures extra audit risk extra test of controls but when you are attempting the exam in the first go try to finish off in accordance with the marking scheme never go for the extra points okay guys so this is the question which i have selected for the today's session apart from the march june 2022 i have selected this question intentionally because i believe this is a question i did not cover during my normal classes with any batch okay the name of the question is called sagittari and company let's straight away go to the exam requirement part a Describe substantive procedures the auditor should perform to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence in relation to the company's income. So they have not used the word revenue, rather income. Why? Because this is a charity. But you could assume that they are using the international financial reporting standards and there are five marks. So you just need five procedures. So before we move on to the solution, I'm giving you two, three minutes to read this story about this charity called Vega Vista. And you might be able to come up with five procedures on your own. Maybe you don't need my help anymore. A comparisons, cost a breakdown, maybe comparison on a category by category basis. If they have, you know, if they had an event such as a charity event, maybe a, a concert or something, maybe you would like to recalculate the income drive from them. Maybe you would like to review the subscribers, maybe. So I'm giving you post here and or maybe you would like to review the bank statement and cash day book. So I've given you good enough hints. Try to come up with your own procedures. You have got three, four minutes. Good luck. So what about it? Sir, if we write cost point for accuracy in every part, would they deduct any mark? No, cost the schedule, obtain the schedule. These are pretty normal words. If we add extra, the marker will. Okay, Rihanna Edwards has come up with a question. If the examiner has asked for five substantive procedures or five audit risk or five test of controls, and if somebody is going to come up with six or seven, what the examiner or the marker is going to do? Yes, the marker is going to mark all of them. And the marker is going to give you the marks for the best ones. But see, this is not the recommended approach. Far better option would be to take a minute, plan your answer, think what you are about to write rather than review it after writing so take a moment and plan the answer and then attempt the question okay mn has come up with a unique question 
if we describe the good procedure but mention the wrong assertion then what the examiner will not give you any mark whatsoever because you are you are not getting the crux or the bottom line of the topic is this clear can i move on are you all done with your own effort with respect to these procedures It's not mandatory to mention assertion for every procedure provided your procedure is making sense to the marker and the reader. But to be on the safe side, you could refer to the assertion. It's not a big deal. Don't create or don't consider it as a huge thing. Take it easy. <laughs> okay, Mahat Avayas has raised a beautiful question. In this question, completeness regarding the income is a key audit risk. Isn't it quite unusual for income to be not complete? Well done. Absolutely right. But what about it? This is a charity, my dear. And if it is a charity, we would like to omit the income. We would like to fill our pockets. We would like to have a situation where we have deep pockets and we might want to, you know, not recognize particular income as the real income of the charity. So let's assume I am collecting donations on behalf of my charity in a shopping mall. And I've received $10,000 cash. Well, I might hand over 5,000 or 6,000 cash to the charity, to the office, and I might put four thousand dollars in my pocket so what's the risk over here the risk is what's the risk the completeness of income is a key risk over here is this clear thank you mn okay charlie has asked obtain a schedule what does that mean it means get the breakdown make sure you are starting from the opening balance then you are adding up what whatever needs to be added up and then you are deducting whatever needs to be deducted and then you are you know going down the line finally to the closing balance this is what we mean by obtain a schedule oh yes mahat anshira if you could refer a particular procedure with an assertion good for you if you are unable to okay leave it for now with the help of if you're going to solve anshira five to six questions twice things would become easier for you okay can i move to the solution now yeah so what about it you are getting the breakdown of the charity's income and you are casting it why you are casting it in order to verify completeness and accuracy you are comparing the individual categories of income why you are comparing it because you just want to figure out if there is any unusual fluctuation and if it is there i will investigate it further because if there is unusual fluctuation let's say there is a dip in a particular thing Maybe that's not complete. So it's about completeness. What about that annual event? Well, you're a smart person. You know the, how to use a calculator or a software. So you could recalculate $35 per ticket. How many tickets approximately they can sell, sell it off 15,000. And if the amount they, which they have recognized is not in line with your calculation, you need to have discussion with the management. What about the ticket sold on the final day? So you get you will reconcile from the ticket stub 
how many tickets they have sold and then then multiplied with 35 and agree that the same amount has been received within the company's trial balance within the company's cash they book within the company's bank statement so this is not a difficult procedure. these are not difficult procedure considering you're already done with revenue that's why i am moving to the next part which is the most favorite part of the double examiner the examiner would test provisions somehow or the other provisions against the warranty claims provisions against a legal case by the company's ex director maybe for a constructive or unfair dismissal provisions against the such as restructuring provision or some kind of provision will be there in the exam so what about the exam requirement describe the substantive procedure the auditor should perform in order to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence in relation to the company's restructuring provision so the company has restructured themselves so they have recognized certain amount of provision okay let's read the question so this is a new company this is not about that charity c company recently announced plans to fundamentally restructure their production process and because of the changes they are going to make they have included 2.1 million restructuring provision in the draft financial statement so they have got to a point 2.1 million in the financial statement so i'll get the breakdown of this bloody 2.1 million cast it and make sure with the it is in line with the trial balance and the statement of financial position let's check it out let's please read this first procedure are you clear Are you clear with respect to first procedure now considering it's about the provision there has to be some kind of discussion within the board so i need to review the board minutes of the meetings in order to figure out when they formally you know agreed upon it and when they formally announced it so i need to review the board minutes in order to quantify the issue review the board minutes in order to understand when the you know when the decision to restructure the production process was taken and confirm the decision was made actually during the year okay this restructure involves a refurbishment of the factories purchase of the new plant equipment and retraining of existing staff now you cannot recognize the retraining cost as your provision so you need to make sure obtain the breakdown of the restructuring provision and confirm that only direct expenditures relating to the restructuring provision is included for example the cost of retraining to the employees cannot be recognized according to is 37 and according to other accounting standards secondly in order to make sure that this 2.1 million is not understated check out the post year and actual payments with respect to this restructuring provision and make sure that this 2.1 million is not understated how would i verify make sure from the post year and bank statement and cash day book that the actual payments are in line with this 2.1 million well check it out from the solution review the post year and payments make sure that the actual cost incurred is in line with the year and provision make sure that 2.1 million was a reasonable estimate is this something relevant to the management is this something relevant to the judgment yes obtain the written representation from the management and make sure that this 2.1 million is complete and they have not missed out anything and get their written representation last but not the least review the adequacy of the disclosures with respect to i37 provisions contingent liabilities and contingent assets make sure that the disclosure is adequate and it is in line and it, there's nothing missed out last part is about the bank loans and i am skipping the bank loans for you it's not difficult at all okay let's explore it quickly read this part by yourself bank loans so they got a loan of 4.8 million they are making repayments on a quarterly basis so it's about the split between the current and non-current liability so you need to recalculate that it's about getting the breakdown obtain the schedule opening balances loans paid off during the year agreeing it with the trial balance and the year end statement of financial position you need to review and you need to understand the loan agreement in order to understand things you need to review the disclosures 
in order to understand that the, they have completely disclosed of everything. You might want to recalculate the, prof, the, the finance cost in accordance with the loan agreement. So this is about the disclosures. This is about the split of the loan. This is about the schedule. And whatever, whatever the amount repaid during the year, make sure it is in line with the bank statement and cash day book. Review the bank statement or review the bank correspondence. Maybe there's some kind of dispute or any penalty or something. And Make sure they have paid this 150,000 and it is reflected in the cash day book and bank statement. Is this clear? Can you do it now on yourself? Obviously, it will take an effort. Are you clear? Yes, Fatima, we are going to get written representation and it is going to be a weak evidence, but we have to rely on the written representation because that provision has got to do with the management's intention. So we have to rely on management. We didn't get we didn't get written representation in, a, in every case. It's a unique case, so I'm getting it. No, I mean, it's not about going concern. No worries. OK, Mahath is clear. That's wonderful. Omar is clear. That's wonderful. MN is clear. So finally, we are done with the second past paper question. Mind you, this past paper question is also a very, very recent one. So this is it. Now I need to conclude things and I need to come up with the story of overall syllabus. I need to teach you what I'm what I'm expecting from you. For the next 24 hours now listen to me. Forget the question answer session. We'll come back to it after five to ten minutes. Dear students. Substantive procedures and OTQs are the backbone of the syllabus. So please solve at least three OTQs in the morning, three OTQs in the evening from both kids. OK. Second thing, before you join me for the fourth and the final day, and I might give you a plan as well on the fourth day. To the live attendees. Before you join in for the fourth and the final day, please invest the next 24 hours on substantive procedures only. Please attempt three questions twice each. Which three questions? Those two questions which we did tonight. What were the names of these two questions? Number one, Sagittari and Spinach number third question, which I'm recommending to all of you. Is the most important question and it's called. Raspberry company. Well, raspberry. Blackberry. Yeah, I think it's raspberry. Can, can, is there anyone who could confirm me the raspberry is on substantive procedures? Or if I have to select fourth most important question. Just to build up the concepts. OK, sorry, sorry, sorry. Raspberry is on internal controls. Thank you, Essen. Thank you very much. And as then, yes, Umul Banin. It's called gooseberry. So the third question which you need to add is called gooseberry. And the fourth question, that's it. I'm not I, I'm not going to add fifth. The fifth question which you could add with and you could prepare and you could type and learn within the next 24 hours would be from your Kaplan kit called Pineapple Beach Hotel. Now, why I didn't use those two important questions uh, called Gooseberry and Pineapple Beach because those two questions I've already covered in my some other webinar. That's why. And maybe and more importantly, I did cover those two questions during the normal live classes. So I wanted to make sure that my regular students could get some benefit out of this session. So I came up with new questions. So I hope you don't mind that. So these questions were equally important. So there are four questions which I am requesting and suggesting to you 
and you could type and learn those four questions twice within the next 24 hours because you have to master this topic the names of those four questions but if you could send it in the whatsapp group just like you did yesterday number one gooseberry number two pineapple beach hotel both of these questions are available in your kaplan kit number third and the number fourth from this webinar content sagittari and spinach it is practically possible and doable one question will take one hour okay 1.5 hour so that gives you you know six hours of typing and learning if you are going to solve all four questions so if you are going to do it twice that won't take another 1.5 hour per question that will take half an hour per question so overall i am requesting and i'm suggesting you to attempt or to invest eight to nine hours on substantive procedures within the next 24 hours no math it will create a thing called learning curve you will be conscious you will not rote learn it. You will be aware why are you doing it? What are you doing it? Why you are applying a procedure? So it will help you rather than it will it will not create problems for you. It will be a favorable variance rather than an adverse. Though variances are never good, they're not they are never recommended. So this is it from my side. Now before I finish off today's lecture let me tell you something which some of you wanted it so this is the syllabus we have got right so basically as an audit firm i will not accept any xyz client a i will consider my ethical stance and then an, then i will filter out certain companies or certain clients and then finally i will accept a particular company so this is the first topic called accs code of ethics and conduct and then the acceptance once i will accept a client i need to understand something about the corporate governance and something about the internal audit so those two are my topic number two and three of the syllabus corporate governance and internal audit if the company is making sure of corporate governance if the company is having an internal audit department that creates you know that lowers down my burden so it's about corporate governance and internal audit after ethics and acceptance so these are the first three topics of the syllabus then i need to assess the audit risk i need to understand i should not come up with incorrect audit opinion so i call it audit risk audit risk has got two parts a the financial statements are vulnerable we call it risk of material misstatement b i might not be able to detect the material misstatements within the financial statement we call it detection risk both could be and will be tested within your exam then once i've considered the risk i will apply test of controls and i will look up to the control systems of the company this is what we call internal control system and we have got six systems in our syllabus once i've understood the systems then finally i will apply the substantive procedures <coughs> sorry in order to verify the fine in order to verify whether the financial statements are reflecting a true and fair view or not this is the topic number six and we call it substantive procedures last but surely not the least at the end of the audit after the substantive procedures i need to come up with review i need to look up to the going concern and the subsequent events and then i need to come up with the with the important thing called audit report and within the audit report there is a thing called audit opinion so that's the topic number seven so topic number one according to my sequence that the way i teach it ethics and acceptance then corporate governance parallel to corporate governance is internal audit so ethics corporate governance internal audit then we go to the risk then we go to the controls then we go to the substantive procedures last but not the least review and reporting so anyone out there who was wondering about the course content this is it but wait a second wait a second wait a second in your final exam in your final exam out of 100 mark paper bare minimum 30 marks in fact bare minimum 35 marks or maybe approximately 40 marks will be from ethics 
corporate governance, internal audit, and completion review and audit report. So tomorrow we are going to try and explore all of them. So you should not miss out the day four. If you will miss out day four, you will unfortunately be among those students who tend to fail this exam, not because of their major areas, but because of their minor areas. So if there is any question or concern, please raise it now. Otherwise, I would love to see you tomorrow live and exclusive just to make sure we end up on a high note and we cover all the minor topics in as much detail as possible. Okay, Shezadi Hussain Bucks, are you absolutely clear now? Because those five minutes were dedicated to you. Tareem Fatma, would you please share the mock exam after day four? Well, uh, well, I will. My the scheduled mock exam for my students is on 24th August. Osama Zayed has asked, can we get marks for bookish procedure provided it makes sense? Thank you very much, Umar. I'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Most welcome. Thank you, Eman. Okay, so thank you. And I'll see you tomorrow with all those minor topics. I'll be starting with ethics. Then I will cover corporate governance. Then I will cover a bit of internal audit. And then I will cover the audit report, especially at the end of the tomorrow session within the last 10 minutes, I will cover a thing called impact on audit report, which almost every student will get in the final exam. Impact on audit report, five marks, impact on audit report. Thank you, and I'll see you soon. Bye bye. Well, if there is anyone who's wondering about the number, you can get the number from, uh, well, you can, you can send me a text over here and then I will add you up in the WhatsApp group. Thank you.